my name is Harun, and the thing I want to talk about today pretty much is why we should make more stuff. Um, that's pretty vague sounding. Um, so uh, again, uh, I want to start by saying thanks and sorry. Um, thanks for the invite. Thanks for having me out here. Um, it's actually the first B-Sides that I'm speaking at. Um, and uh, to all of you, thanks for coming. Uh, it's a Saturday, and I'm sure you had better things to do. And in truth, most keynotes generally are terrible. Like, like I've watched lots and lots of talks in my life, but very few keynotes, because generally they're pretty bad. Um, normally, they some old guy trying to sell you stuff, um, or it's an old guy uh, trying to give you advice. And uh, this one is pretty much an old guy trying to give you advice. Um, for those of you who remember in the 90s, there was a song called Wear Sunscreen. Um, and, and part of the reason why I think uh, you should say thanks, or I should say thanks, is because giving advice almost requires a favor from you. Like you've got to grin and bear it, like I actually know what I'm talking about. Um, and then I'd like to say sorry um, for one part because my voice is a little nasally for the other because I keep saying um, um, a lot. Um, I've been told that I should do better. Two years ago, my sister sent me a message telling me she's going for training, I should really go training in, in the sort of way that only a big sister can do. And, and the other reason I want to say sorry is because I actually saw Sharif's slides and they're beautiful and they're smart and mine are none of those things, um, which is probably a pointer for who you should get to keynote next year. Um, the other reason I want to say sorry, two more reasons, is because if you've ever spent any time with me, the stuff that I'm going to say now, you've probably heard before. Um, not because I'm lazy, but because I really believe in some of the stuff that I'm going to say, and chances are you've heard me rant about it before. Um, and the other reason that's worth mentioning is some of the stuff will probably sting a little. Like, um, in part, I think that that's what a keynote should be. Like, if a keynote came up and just said what you were expecting, it would be a pretty terrible keynote. Um, but, but I think that, that sometimes it's necessary. And, and the main piece of advice that I want to give is, um, like, try to resist the urge to just kick it out because of something that I say that's stupid or because I say, um, too much. Um, there's, there's probably uh, some stuff that's worth listening to in there. Um, so, so right at the top, the question should be, um, why should you listen to me? In truth, I can't think of too many good reasons. Um, in, in terms of my bio, um, I've been doing technical security stuff. I've been computering for a pretty long time. And, and one of the good things is, like, I've been really lucky to work in lots of different roles and with some of the best people in the industry. So, so even if the stuff didn't rub off onto me, like I've had a chance to look at some really great people up close. And, and with that comes some insights into what makes the difference between people who are absolutely leaders in the field um, and people who are not. Um, so what the talk is about, um, really simply, um, I'm going to do three things. Um, one, I'm going to get on my favorite soapbox um, for a little bit. Um, two is a little bit of a hack. I'm going to give you interesting links. So even if everything that I say is stupid, if you follow the links that I give you, it should be worth the talk. Um, and then Sharif insisted that I leave time for questions, uh, mostly so you guys can disagree with me and tell me why I'm stupid. Um, so my soapbox, for the most part, is just two points. It's why I want us uh, to make more things, and then I want to look a little bit at why we haven't been making things, okay? Um, which, is, which is pretty simple. Um, so in terms of making more things, I'm going to start off. How many of you here with a quick show of hands uh, can code? So some level of scripting. Uh, how many of you think you don't need to? Okay, it's a discussion that comes up periodically where people ask in the industry, like, do I need to code to do security? And if you go online, you'll see people disagreeing, even some smart people saying that you don't need to. And 
I want to say, I think they cut my mic. Okay. Uh, I want to say absolutely, I think you need to code. Let's try this. Okay. So, so I'm going to say you absolutely need to code. Okay. And, and uh, again, this is one of those things that might sting if you can't. Um, but it's something you should absolutely work on. And, and I say this to all my young cousins, to all my family, like no matter what career you're in right now, like even if you're in pharmacy, coding is a superpower. It'll help you do whatever you do better. And if you're planning on doing InfoSec, then it's absolutely a must have. Now this doesn't mean you need to code at the level where you can pass a Google coding interview, but you should be able to script in Perl, Python, C Sharp, something. You should be able to bash script together and automate stuff. Um, for security, I've actually got a few arguments for it, but, but I'm going to choose two today. Um, the one is, a little while back, um, I gave a talk at a conference uh, in Finland um, where I spoke about learning the wrong lessons from offense. So for years, we've been telling people that they need to learn from attackers. You need to learn how attackers work. And mostly, that advice has been terrible, okay? You can't just learn to think like an attacker in the same way that you can't just learn to think like a chef. If you tell someone, go into a kitchen, think like a chef, chances are they're not gonna do anything great. Um, but one of the big things, um, and, and you can look at several advantages that attackers have over defenders, but one of the big ones is that attackers write code, okay? It's really hard to find people who do good offensive work who don't also code, okay? They're patching their tools all the time, they're writing new tools all the time. It's almost essential if you want to be uh, an apex grade attacker. Um, uh, yep, sorry. Try swapping. <laughs> cool, sorry. Um, so, uh, a few years back, Alex Stamos gave a talk where he divided the world. He said if you looked at the Fortune 500, you'd have the secure 100 who knew how to play the game, and under that, he had what he called the toasted 400, okay? And when asked the biggest difference between those two, you'll see, he said, secure software engineering, engineering-focused IR, and the ability to create, not buy solutions was the big differentiator between whether you were in the can play the game or the toasted 400. Okay, this is a huge, huge thing to ponder. You're talking about the 500 richest companies in the world, and 400 of them are considered toasted. You've got to figure where your organization fits into this. And of course, famously in 2011, Mark Andreessen said, software is eating the world. Okay, essentially he was saying that all companies will be software companies um, in the future. And we see this happening now with good defensive teams. For a long time, it didn't matter what you were doing in security, you almost couldn't defend your organization. And then we started to see really solid security teams coming out of startups in Silicon Valley. Um, this is one of those slides where later on, if you go and pick the links, it makes the whole talk worth it. Um, just because you should totally go and watch these talks. Um, so, so from the top, I'm gonna talk about those two guys um, did a talk when they were working for Square. Um, they did a talk on crypto anchors. Um, hands up anyone who's ever heard of crypto anchors or anyone who's watched this talk. Okay, I see one and a half hand. I'll find out how the half works later. Um, so essentially their talk went around the logic that said attackers can break into your network, but make sure that they can't steal stuff on your network to use your data they've got to use it on your network. So they introduced uh, an intermediary on their network so that if you break in, you've got to talk to the intermediary to get your data out. Um, it's not terribly sophisticated, but two things are super interesting about it. And one of them is, traditionally, security people just stood in the corner and told everyone what they can and can't do. But at Square, their security people are writing code that's in line with every transaction that Square transacts with. Okay, so you don't have security people just telling people no. You have your security teams actually building the code that everyone is running. 
The other thing that was super interesting about their talk is they point out that once you build infrastructure, you start to find other uses for it that you didn't know you had when you started. Okay, so you start to see this accumulation of value in the organization. You build it for one reason, and then you find other reasons that make it worthwhile. Um, next to him is John Flynn. Um, so John Flynn, who's now the CISO at Uber, gave a talk when he was working at Facebook. And he gave a talk on how they built their two-factor authentication system. Um, with a show of hands, how many people here are still struggling to get 2FA, MFA into their orgs? Everybody got it? Everyone sorted? Okay, there's a few people's hands up. If you watch this talk, you'll see the path that John and them went down at Facebook, where they introduced the system, so they went with Duo and YubiKeys. And then for the whole talk, he goes through a series of, we did this, and it wasn't good enough. We did this, we needed to make it faster. We did this, and then we optimized it. Way down to the point where they customized Duo, they customized SSH, and now, it's faster to authenticate using two-factor authentication at Facebook than it is to not use two-factor authentication at Facebook. So now you have all the developers authenticating, not because it's more secure, but because it's faster. It also happens to be more secure. Okay, so you're starting to see the value that developers actually bring. Um, at the bottom, um, you see Netflix and Slack. Again, great security teams both putting out tons of tools um, out into the public. How many of you here have started playing with eBPF? Um, anyone? So if you've got Linux boxes at this point, it's stuff you should be looking at. Um, the guys at Netflix recently pointed out that them, they have something like 40 eBPF scripts running on their servers. Facebook have something like 15. What's interesting is none of these people are saying, yes, we're running CrowdStrike. They're not saying, yes, we're running carbon black. What they're saying is, yes, every server that we have runs custom eBPF scripts that we wrote. And that's how we're doing real-time detection on our servers. Okay, it's a complete mind shift from let's just buy stuff to let's build stuff in our orgs that we know works. And, and one of the things that you're seeing from all of this is, like, it's my contention that it's the best time ever to be working as a defender of a network. Okay, for a long time, if you were a defender on a network, it kind of sucked. The, the cool activity was the guys doing red team work. I if, if I were choosing to start my career right now, defense at an organization is absolutely where you want to be. Like, all of us got into pen testing because we thought that's where the hard problems were. It turns out it's not that hard. Most people are just broken. Um, question is whether you can actually defend stuff and, and start defending stuff at scale. Um, there's super interesting problems to be solved um, working in defense. Um, so I said I'd, I'd take two things. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is something personal, which is something that we bought um, called Canary Tokens. Um, I'm not sure how many of you um, have ever seen this. Um, it's free, so we're not trying to sell you anything. Um, something that's interesting about Canary Tokens, and the reason why, why I want to discuss it here, is Canary Tokens is one of the dumbest pieces of software you're likely to find on the internet. It's really not clever at all. I built the first version of it in a weekend here in Doha. Okay, and, and if we look at the, the simple way that Canary Tokens works, you go to it, we take the web bug, I put in an email address, I put in a reminder, like in this, side, in this case, B-Sides demo, and I say create your token. And it comes back and it gives me some sort of URL. And the logic here is I put that URL somewhere. When some attacker visits it, he gets nothing. And I get an alert that tells me somebody just visited this URL. All of you here should be able to see how that works, right? It's super dumb. You create a random URL, you save it with the reminder. When someone visits that URL, you tell the person what the reminder is, right? It's completely remedial. Um, and the second remedial thing is you can do the same for DNS, right? So someone visits you, we take their email address, we take the memo, 
and we give them back a DNS host name. And if someone looks up that DNS host name, we'll give them an alert saying somebody just looked up this DNS name. Again, it's ridiculously stupid, okay? Nothing intelligent about it. But what's interesting is we built this thing and we put it out in the world. And the first thing that started happening is people in our team said, hold on, if someone's going to visit your link, we can run stuff in their browser. So instead of just telling you the IP that visited you, you can now geolocate the IP. You can tell what plugins are running in their browser. You can tell if their browser leaks information. And then someone figured out, well, if you can do that for a URL, you can embed it in a Word doc or a PDF doc. So same logic, give someone a doc, the moment they open that doc, an alert goes through. And then you start to think, well, hold on, if I can do that for a doc, why don't you put macros in the doc? And when the macro is run, you can alert and, and give someone a warning that bad stuff is happening. And then cleverer people started adding on to it. So now you can sign a Windows binary, and the moment the binary is executed, you can get an alert. Or you can get an AWS alert. So effectively, you visit us, we give you a working AWS API key, and the moment that API key is used, you get a warning telling you that your API key has been used. Now again, the main thing I want to point out is, this was inherently a really stupid thing, a really simple to code thing. But once we built it and shared it, smarter people started adding to it. In fact, some really smart people, so for those of you who don't know Colin Mulliner, he's a really great security researcher who currently works at Square. Colin Mulliner did, uh, currently works at, yeah. He did some research where you can embed these canary tokens inside of binaries to detect when binaries are being reverse engineered. The guys at Cruise did it and started putting Canary tokens inside all of their cars. Um, the guys at Usenix um, invited me to give a talk about it. And again, fundamentally, I'm saying I wanted to speak at Usenix my whole life. And the way I got to go there was this really stupid weekend project that just took a life on its own. And if actually the reason you're doing this is to catch real attackers, um, you'll notice pen testers saying, actually, if I know there's Canary tokens on a network, it makes me scared to use anything that I find. And then you'll see cases with actual attackers or actual companies finding out that they've been compromised, in this case by Russian attackers, because they had dropped Canary tokens on their network. Um, so at this point, Canary tokens on the internet have been used something like a quarter million times. Like people get alerts every day. And fundamentally, it's really simple code. The only difference is we did it and we shared it. Now, when you see this, one of your first thoughts are going to be, yeah, it's different because you did that, or maybe it's different because you built this thing and got lucky. And the truth is, we did get lucky. Like over the years, we've built and shared lots and lots and lots of things. Like I did a search um, for this talk and like the first public tool I released was in 2001. And that was really ugly Perl script. And if you go through, you'll see it in 2001, 2002, 2000, 2007. And, and what you'll notice is my early stuff may have been tragically horrible, but over time it got slightly less dumb. Okay, and, and for that, I want to play you a quick snippet um, by someone called Ira Glass, and hopefully this actually plays. Nobody uh, tells people who are beginners, and I really wish somebody had told this to me, is that um, all of us who do creative work, like, you know, we get into it, and we get into it because we have good taste. But it's like there's a gap, that for the first couple of years that you're making stuff, what you're making isn't so good, okay? It's not that great. It's, it's, it's trying to be good. It has ambition to be good, but it's not quite that good. But your taste, the thing that got you into the game, your, your taste is still killer. And your taste is good enough that you can tell that what you're making is kind of a disappointment to you. You know what I mean? A lot of people never get past that phase. A lot of people at that point, they quit. And the thing I, I would just like say to you with all my heart is that m most everybody I know who does interesting creative work they went through a phase of years 
where they had really good taste, they could tell what they were making wasn't as good as they wanted it to be. They knew it felt short. It didn't have this special thing that we wanted it to have. And the thing I would say to you is everybody goes through that. And for you to go through it, if you're going through it right now, if you're just getting out of that phase, you got to know it's totally normal. And the most important possible thing you could do is do a lot of work. Do a huge volume of work. Put yourself on a deadline so that every week or every month you know you're going to finish one story. Because it's only by actually going through a volume of work that you're actually going to ca catch up and close that gap. And your, the work you're making will be as good as your ambitions. In my case, like I, I took longer to figure out how to do this than anybody I've ever met. It takes a while. It's going to take you a while. It's normal to take a while. And you just have to fight your way through that. Okay? And so at this point, I want to switch slightly to ask, why haven't we been making stuff? Like, like if making stuff is so cool, and I feel it is, why don't we make great software? Or, or why don't we make great software companies? Like, like if you look at the region, and if you take, like I'm from South Africa, I can't think of a single South African software company that, that, that is worth mention. Um, I can't think of too many from the region. Why don't we? Um, and I'll take a break. We'll go and try to answer this in a long roundabout way, because I've got the mic, um, to talk a little bit about a book that I read last year that I absolutely loved. Um, if you haven't read this book, you should totally check it out. Um, so, so this book is um, by the guy who led the team that landed the Mars rover, the second Mars rover. It's a great book that talks about technical challenges and how to lead technical teams. And, and one of the great things um, when you go through this book, so we're not going to get a chance to watch this whole video, but, but one of the great things um, when you watch this is you see that these guys had to deal with really impossible physics, right? They're landing a parachute in Mars atmosphere where there's no atmosphere. And then they've got to land on terrain that they don't understand. And then, like, everything is different. The speed that you're entering with means that no parachute holds up. The, the heat shields get destroyed. Um, they don't know what land's going to look like. Um, and they come up with this ridiculous crane idea that says they'll have this thing hover, and then a crane will actually lower the car and that's how Mars rover eventually lands on Mars. And, and at the time, um, Adam Stelzner worked for JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratories. And the book is great. But the interesting thing is that if you read the book, it ends up making you really sad. Um, and, and the reason it makes you really sad is you hit a point where you realize that that's reserved just for a few countries in the world. Like, if you study physics or engineering, you're not going to do the sort of physics or engineering that has problems that have never been solved before, like they get to do because they're working at JPL. I'm born South African. That's just never going to be mine. I can't work on rockets for the US unless I, un unless I change. And, and when you see that JPL was formed in the 30s and are working on all these incredible problems that we'll never get to work on. So, so our students study physics and they study engineering and they graduate, but they're just never going to get a chance to chomp on those sorts of problems. And the good thing about that is that software is so different, right? Because if, if you're doing software today, um, you have a MacBook just like anyone else in Silicon Valley. You're reading the same books as anyone in Silicon Valley. You've got the same internet. You can even study the same courseware. If, in fact, if you start your company today, you're probably building it on exactly the same infrastructure as other US startups are being built. So why don't we build great software or great software companies? If we as smart and have the same infrastructure, why don't we? Um, anyone have want to take a chance? Anyone? Yeah. 
That's a good answer. Nobody wants to put their neck on the line. It's, so I'll get to just about the same conclusion. Like putting your neck on the line is, is big. Um, and one of the reasons that we should knock off really quickly, because this comes up anytime anyone talks about Silicon Valley, is we don't have access to their venture capital. Because everyone knows Silicon Valley is full of venture capitalists ready to fund uh, whatever ridiculous Juicero idea you have. Um, and I just don't think that that's true. Um, in fact, if you look at really, really great companies created over the years, you'll find that funding isn't always a requirement. Like Microsoft, with their current 1.2 trillion uh, market cap, only raised about a million dollars. Um, Apple raised about three. A company like MailChimp is currently valued at like 4.2 billion, and they raised nothing. Like it all belongs to the two founders who started. And just about everyone here who raised their hand and said that they can program can see how you'd build a MailChimp, right? There's some web interface stuff, there's some send mail stuff. Like it's not technically impossible. The question is just, well, why don't we? And, and a simple answer is we don't because we don't. Um, largely, um, we've been trained to become nothing more than consumers. We consume the world's software and, and we produce none of it. And in part, this goes back to a type of colonization where we don't think we can. Um, so, so really recently, uh, Ben Horowitz put out a book called um, What You Do Is Who You Are. Um, and, and a central part of the book that he keeps talking about is uh, Toussaint Louverture, who led the first uh, Haitian slave revolution. And one of the things that he keeps talking about uh, in the book is how most slave revolutions fail. In fact, he claims that all slave revolutions failed over the years. And the reason he gives for this, or the reason that's given for this, is because slaves have had their thinking changed. So that A, they don't think overthrowing their masters is possible, but B, when they do, they behave badly. Because slaves have been trained not to plan for tomorrow. A slave gets what he can, he takes it now. There's no tomorrow, he's not allowed possessions. So, so given the choice between ratting out someone today and getting a meal, first maybe that guy and I can build a country tomorrow, you rat him out and take your meal. Um, and and this, type of, um, this type of thinking is well studied as uh, coming through when you've been colonized too. Um, for anyone here who's done any sort of pen testing, this, this is the latest uh, cyberscape that came out. There's something like 3,000 security products in the world today, or companies in the world today. How many of you here do pen testing? Um, quick show of hands. How many of you get stopped by any corporate product ever? Right? You'll see nobody, like, like I stopped pen testing years ago, but no product ever slowed us down. Like, not even a speed bump. So you've got all these products that we all know suck, okay? And we're okay with them sucking. Like somehow, we tolerate that. But when it comes to software we want to build, um, we just don't think it can be done. And, and what's worse is, we see this in two ways. We don't think we can do it, and we also don't think people who are like us can do it. So we'll happily buy software if it's made in San Francisco, we just won't buy software if it's made down the street because it's unlikely to be very good. Um, in 2018, um, there was this thread that went on Twitter. I'm not sure how many of you saw it, but someone started tweeting about the insides of Tesla. So apparently some guy who worked at Tesla started writing about the state of the Tesla network. And it's a dog show, right? Like it's terrible, like open VPN, unpatched Ubuntu boxes, um, guys SSHing into cars to reboot them because patches haven't been applied. And, and this guy went on for pages and pages 
of just how terrible um, the state of Ubuntu software or the state of Tesla's software is. And what's interesting is a whole bunch of really experienced security people and dev people came back. These are all just complaints about the state of Tesla's software. And then probably one of the most famous hackers in the world, Mudge, came back and said, dear world, that's right. Like, software sucks. And, and what's interesting is, I'm not saying it in this case to say, hey, this is scary. I'm taking it to say, yes, software is bad. Like, all software is bad. The question is, why do we think our software is worse? Um, last month, um, Chris Anderson, um, he used to be the chief editor of Wired, was complaining about the thing that journalists get wrong. And what he said was, when journalists cover tech companies, they often report on how terrible things are, but what they don't realize is, everyone's company is terrible. Like, you don't, you don't think Google is especially bad, they all bad. And, and again, what's interesting is, if you compare it then, if you compare Doha and San Francisco, my technical friends in both places know that software is bad. But in San Francisco, people go, yes, it's bad, let's build our thing because, hey, we should be able to do better. And down here we go, it's bad, let's throw it out and buy another one. Okay, and, and fundamentally, the guys who are in the game trying are gonna iterate and get better over time, and we just buy new stuff, and we're gonna be standing in the same spot. But there's good news. And the good news is that while JPL needs 15 billion over three years to run, building software costs you almost nothing, um, certainly compared to 15 billion um, US dollars. And, and the question then is how? And the answer is we just have to start. Um, we just have to start believing more in ourselves and believing that actually building stuff has value. Um, and, and one of the good things is, the other way so clearly hasn't worked. Like buying McAfee or buying Symantec stuff has done nothing to help keep our network secure. Like at this point, you might as well try building it because the other stuff was rubbish. Okay, you can't do too much worse than the rubbish position we've ended up in. Um, if, if that's not trite enough, um, I'll say as my conclusion, um, you've got to start with being honest with ourselves, okay? And, and by this I mean, you have to actually look at ourselves and say, yes, we've become just the consumers of the world. And, and for that, we completely at ransom. So, so we can't put forward alternatives to anything. Um, just because it's almost impossible to give a talk without this, um, there's a paper called You and Your Research by Richard Hamming. You absolutely have to read. Um, if you do any sort of security or any type of research, um, you should read this paper. And, and one of the interesting things here is Richard Hamming starts uh, right at the beginning saying, well, how did I do this study? He says, I worked with great people. I worked with Beth. I worked with, with Feynman. And I saw that I was a stooge. But what's interesting is you notice Hamming actually stopping and taking honest account of himself. Okay, going, actually, where do I fit into this picture? Um, secondly, um, we need to be kinder to each other. Um, I've seen tons and tons of times in Doha, in South Africa, it happens a lot when you become consumers of technology where people absolutely snipe at each other to show why software is rubbish. Again, yes, it's rubbish. You work around it to make it fit for your organization. Um, for that, I want to reference, but won't uh, keep on screen. You should read Anton Ego's speech from Ratatouille. Um, and, and the main thing that, uh, that Anton Ego puts across here is that the new needs friends. It's really easy to criticize. Criticism is worth very little. Most times your criticism is worth less than the piece of junk you're criticizing. What actually needs friends is new things. 
um, give it a try. Um, we should look over the wall. Um, th this is an odd one. Um, so Sharif was right. We have a really nice ecosystem here. But one of the things um, we should all be careful of is measuring ourselves or, or setting our limits just with the people near us. One of the benefits that the internet gives us is that we can completely measure ourselves or grow according to the people on the internet, right? So if everyone next to you thinks that the highest aspiration should be whether you install CrowdStrike or Carbon Black, don't compare yourselves to them. Compare yourselves to the people working at Netflix who are deciding how to use eBPF to secure all of their servers. Okay, um, the internet allows us to choose who our peers are. Um, make your choice. Um, and then um, lastly, just make more stuff. It'll suck at the beginning, um, but it'll get better. Um, at this point, I'll uh, stop for questions uh, like I promised I would. Um, I'm Harun Mir on Twitter, so you can tweet and tell me um, why I'm ridiculous, or we can uh, take questions now. Anyone? Anyone? So my question is, um, how do you find the right balance between, because you can't obviously build everything, you can't build everything, right? Um, and, and building, building takes time. Uh, so how do you find the right balance between choosing what to build and choosing when to buy? Yeah, so it's a good question. So the question is, building takes time. Um, how do you find the right balance between building and, and buying? And, and the answer is, you don't always just build it because you want to build it. If a good solution exists, for sure use the good solution. Um, when you looked at uh, Four's talk, John Flynn's talk for TUFAC, he started off immediately with Duo and YubiKey. He said, because this solution needs to go into model. And so the first thing he did was he put in the paid solution. And then he whittled it down and went, now we can shave time off this. Now we can make it quicker. Now we can get SSH patches. So I'm totally a huge fan of making sure that the stuff you build makes your users happy. And if you take too long, you won't make your users happy. Um, so, so the answer is I'm not saying you have to build, rewrite your own operating systems. Um, I'm saying we need to keep it as an alternative because it's not something we do enough of. Um, anyone else? 